Good afternoon, everyone. It is my intention today to advise the Governor-General of a number of proposed changes to my ministry. And to do that, I'm joined uh, by the Minister for Women and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator Payne. These changes will shake up what needs to be shaken up while maintaining the momentum and the continuity and the stability that Australia needs as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and recession. Those priorities again, the rollout of that vaccine and to suppress the virus, the economic recovery that is well underway with more Australians employed now than there were before the pandemic began. To guarantee those essential services that Australians rely on each and every day, the health services, the disability services, the aged care services, uh, the income support. To stand up for Australia, whether it's against big multinationals or within our own region, to stand up for our interests and ensure we've got what is necessary to back that up. And to continue the important work of caring for our country, as Indigenous Australians have done for centuries and centuries and thousands of years. There'll be no changes in areas such as Treasury, finance, health, social services that go to many of those priorities. But what we must do is address the government's agenda with the changes that we're making and do so, I think, with a fresh lens. And a fresh lens in particular to achieving the outcomes, the results that we all want for Australian women right across the country. Getting these results for Australian women will be achieved through collaboration. They'll be achieved through listening. They'll be achieved by acting together. They won't be achieved by dividing Australians and setting them apart and having further conflict. It'll be achieved by Australians coming together to deal with these very serious and significant issues. The changes I'm announcing today will once again provide the strongest ever female representation in an Australian government cabinet. But it's not just about the size of the female contingent in my cabinet, but it's the skills and the experience, it's the perspective and it's the collaboration they bring to our nation's most difficult tasks. And that indeed extends beyond the cabinet. Women taking up, as they must, as they should, as I very much want them to do, and as they are so keen to do so, these senior roles and in particular the important portfolios right across the government. This is about getting the right input. This is about getting the right perspective. It's about getting that lens on the policy challenges that we're facing and the policy development and delivery work that needs to be undertaken and doing it so in those key agencies of government that are so important for achieving this change. These appointments will be further enhanced by the establishment of a new cabinet task force to drive my government's agenda in response to these key issues involving women's equality, women's safety, women's economic security, women's health and wellbeing. This task force will be co-chaired by Minister Payne and I. It will comprise all female members of my ministry, and there is quite a number. It will also be joined uh, by the portfolio ministers from what is known as the central agencies, the Treasurer, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance. And I'll ask Minister Payne to speak a bit more about that in a moment once I've run through the changes to the ministry. So to those changes. Michaelia Cash will be Australia's next Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations. She has done an outstanding job for our government. She is a fine attorney and she is a fine parliamentarian. And I'm looking forward to her leadership in this role as she also holds the position of Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate in recognition of her significant talents. Anne Ranston will join the leadership team of my government. Those 10 ministers who joined together um, on a very regular basis, of which Minister Payne is also a member. Uh, Anne Ruston will join that team and she will also have, it, ha have added to her title things that she is 
predominantly responsible for right now, and that is Minister for Women's Safety in Cabinet. Karen Andrews uh, will take on the job of Minister for Home Affairs. Karen has done an outstanding job in her role, particularly bringing together and championing Australia's advanced manufacturing strategy. She is a woman of great talent, of great experience and great practicality. I first put Karen into the Cabinet because I believed so heavily in her abilities. And uh, I'm so pleased with the job that she's done and now she's ready for a new job and I think she's going to do an outstanding job. As someone who once held those portfolio responsibilities in some respects, uh, you can forgive me by being pretty particular about who I appoint into Home Affairs and, uh, and she is going to do an outstanding job. Linda Reynolds uh, will, re will remain in Cabinet and will take on the portfolio of Government Services and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I have been in regular contact with both Linda and her doctor at her, with her permission, and she has recovered extremely well. And we have discussed her return to work and agreed that a domestic, follow, a domestic portfolio would be best uh, for her, but she is in good health and I know she will do an outstanding job in this area. She has previously served uh, on the committee for the NDIS and knows those issues extremely well. Uh, she's a, a very good uh, operational minister, and so taking responsibility for government services and the continued rolled out of programs, I think, will smit, uh, fit her skills and talents well. Melissa Price will be returning to Cabinet, so I'll be expanding the Cabinet by one to where it was when Minister Cormann was in the Cabinet. Um, and she will retain the portfolio of defence industry. The defence industry portfolio has previously been in Cabinet um, and when Minister Pine held that portfolio, amongst others, and uh, he did a, an excellent job setting up this procurement program that we're involved in now, and I need a, a keen set of eyes continuing on those projects, significant as, as they are for the Australian Government and our defence, and uh, she has been doing an outstanding job in the outer ministry in this area, and I'm pleased that I'm able to bring her back into Cabinet uh, in that role. Uh, those five ministers uh, will join, of course, Minister Payne and, and Minister Lee, who will continue on in their roles as Foreign Affairs, Minister for Women, and Susan Lee as in, uh, Minister for the Environment. And as you know, Minister Lee also uh, has the House duty uh, responsibilities for Minister for Women. Jane Hume will take on the additional portfolio uh, in the outer ministry of women's economic security. And Amanda Stoker will take on the additional role of, she's currently uh, Assistant Minister to the Attorney General. She will add to that uh, Assistant Minister to the Minister for Industrial Relations, as well as Assistant Minister to the Minister for Women. Minister Payne will effectively become the leader of that group of women. Um, she is effectively um, amongst her female colleagues, uh, the Prime Minister for Women, uh, um, the, holding the prime ministerial re responsibilities in this area as the Minister for Women. It is her job to bring together this great talent and experience across not just the female members of my Cabinet team and the outer ministry and executive, but to draw also in the important contributions, especially in areas such as health and services and aged care and other key important roles that go so much to women's wellbeing in this country. The other changes, uh, Peter Dutton, who has done an extraordinary job as Minister for Home Affairs. Uh, he was the first Minister for Home Affairs in a very, very long time. Um, he succeeded me in the portfolio of Immigration and Border Protection many years ago, and he has carried on that, that great work. Uh, the boats are stopped, he kept them stopped and he has moved in so many other areas of that portfolio. But I know the one that Peter has been most passionate about um, as, a, as a former law enforcement officer himself. He has done extraordinary work to protect children from sexual violence in this country. And he hasn't just done it here. He's sat aside uh, attorney generals of other countries, particularly in the United States and uh, in the United Kingdom and other places to work together to crack down on the sexual pedophile rings that exist all around the world. His, his leadership in that area has been extraordinary and his passion has also been uh, immensely impressive. Uh, so he leaves that portfolio after uh, some very long years of service. And I want to thank Peter very much uh, for the hard road he has had in that portfolio. I have some knowledge and understanding of it. He will take on the job of Minister for Defence 
and he will also take on the job of leader of the government in the House. Stuart Robert, uh, Minister Robert, will take on the job of a critical area for the government's economic strategy. I've mentioned three particular areas that our economic recovery depends on. One is workforce. We have a massive challenge in this country to get the workforce this country needs to do the things we want to do, whether it's build naval ships, whether it's to ensure we have the age care and disability care workforce we need, that we have the number of mental health professionals, uh, whether they be is as uh, psychiatrists or, or counsellors or nurses, um, the rural workforce we need, the systems engineers we need for our defence procurements. We have an enormous workforce challenge, whether it's in our rural and regional areas or the particular areas we need in advanced sciences and other areas to support our manufacturing industries. Workforce is a big piece of our economic puzzle that we must get firmly in place. That combined with employment, uh, skills, small and family business, uh, Minister Robert will take those portfolios on with a great deal of experience, having run his own business as well, uh, including in, uh, in, as an employment business. He knows full well how to pull a team together and create a workforce to do the job. So as Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, he will be a key participant in the government's economic recovery strategy. And Christian Porter uh, will take on a new portfolio uh, for industry, science and technology. Uh, I've spoken uh, to this about Minister Porter over the course of these last few weeks when he's been on mental health leave. Uh, this fully addresses all the issues that relate to the, to the, uh, to the advice received from the Solicitor General as well as uh, the advice received from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet regarding the ministerial guidelines. He's a, a very capable minister and I'm sure he'll apply his considerable talents to that portfolio uh, to the best of his abilities. And so with that, I will ask Minister Payne to speak further. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. I want to acknowledge the importance of the focus that the Prime Minister brings uh, in, uh, in these ministry arrangements, the lens that uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear that he wants applied uh, across government. I think uh, your words, Prime Minister, were to have the right lens on the challenges uh, in key agencies and bringing together a task force which comprises uh, the former senior members of the government, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance, uh, adds and includes uh, all of the women represented across the ministry is a very powerful way to do that. It puts addressing these issues at the centre of government. And that is uh, absolutely the focus that this brings. I think the uh, the increase of the uh, I also welcome the increase of the number of women in cabinet again uh, to see uh, it back to its highest level. The only government that can say that is this government, uh, and it is uh, with great pleasure that I welcome Melissa Price back to uh, the cabinet table. What the engagement of the ministers that the Prime Minister has outlined uh, in the arrangements today gives us uh, is a minister in the Treasury portfolio who has a capacity to direct and focus on women's economic security. Uh, the Minister for Social Services, who has so many of the programs in relation to women's safety and in relation to the prevention of uh, violence against women and their children, in her portfolio with that express and implicit uh, uh, responsibility stated clearly in, uh, in her role. Uh, I have not seen a cabinet put together in this way to address these key issues. Through our women's economic security statement, the work that we have been doing in recent years since the first of those in 2018, we have had a strong focus on economic security, on women's safety and on leadership. This puts that focus at the heart of government and around every single cabinet table discussion uh, whenever the cabinet meets and across the broader ministry. We know that the last few weeks have been extraordinarily challenging, confronting and difficult for so many people in this country, but none more than those women who have had to deal with or address assault or harassment or inappropriate behaviour in their workplaces, in their communities, in their social life, in their families across Australia. And bringing a gender equality lens, if you like, to the whole of ministry approach enables us to really 
focus in on those issues uh, right across government in a way that uh, I have never seen before. I think it's very powerful. I think it's a very important and strong message to the Australian community uh, and one which I'm very pleased to work on with the Prime Minister and with my other senior colleagues. Thanks, Prime Minister. Prime Minister cool. uh, yeah, in relation to the Defence Minister Linda Reynolds, she's obviously been criticised for those comments where she referred to Brittany Higgins as a lying cow. Today we've seen a, an Adelaide radio broadcaster who was sacked for suggesting uh, that women who get drunk uh, in some way are to blame uh, for you know, what happens to them. Now, the criticism has been there were no consequences for Linda Reynolds. Do you see this move as in any way a demotion or a consequence or do you see it in different terms? Well, the, the comment that Linda made was extraordinarily out of character. I mean, people in this place who know Linda Reynolds would have been as shocked um, by her comment as much as that it was she who was making it. Uh, it was an intemperate remark made at the, at the wrong time for all the wrong reasons, and she has uh, completely apologised for that sincerely. That apology has been accepted and, and the issue has been resolved. And so that's where that matter rests. And so it is now a matter for you know, the government getting on with, with, with that job and, and for Linda to be able to uh, take up new responsibilities. I mean, she was previously serving in the, as the Minister for Defence. It's a very senior role within the government. Uh, she has stepped aside from that role and is taking on a new role within the government. And I think that reflects um, where she is best able to serve the government. Has said this morning that she doesn't feel comfortable. Sarah Henderson this morning has said she doesn't feel comfortable being in the same party room as Andrew Lamming, Lamming giving his uh, inappropriate behaviour towards women. How can you justify having him or keeping him in your party room, given you've said that you're, it's up to you to get your house in order first? Well, getting the house in order means me explaining very clearly to Andrew that his behaviour was unacceptable and that his behaviour needs to change and that he needs to seek support and help to change his behaviour. And that is exactly what he is doing at his own expense in terms of the, uh, the, the, the support that he's seeking through the services that he'll now access. Um, see, what we need to do here is change behaviour. So when he returns, that he will be, I think, in a better position I think to give that assurance to other colleagues and anyone else. He was elected at the last election. He, is, he has done something quite significant. He has said he is not seeking re-election. That is not a small thing to do, to, to walk away from a career in politics that he has served his community now for many, many years. So he is, he's, he's taken that on the chin and he's reflected on his own actions and he is not putting himself forward uh, for re-election and re-nomination by the Liberal Party. And he's reflected on the conversation he and I had over the course of the weekend. And I'm pleased that he is taking that instruction to get that support, to change his behaviour. And I believe we will see him return um, uh, better for that experience and better able, I think, to provide his colleagues with the assurances that, that they are seeking and that they, that, and that they legitimately seek. But let's not forget what our goal is here. Our goal across all of these issues is to change behaviour. Andrew has said he wants to change his behaviour, so we intend him to support him to do just that. Yeah. Prime, Minister, Prime Minister, you've called Senator Payne the Prime Minister for Women, but aren't you the Women's Prime Minister? Are you not fit to do the job of Prime Minister? I think you may have misunderstood the point I was trying to make. Of course I'm the Prime Minister. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, in this case, the Minister for Women is the, the, the minister that is primarily responsible for drawing together the many different women who have been given ministerial responsibilities for women. I mean, if I had uh, not made that comment, I may have been accused of having too many ministers for women and what was Mary Payne doing? Well, that would also have not been the case. What I'm simply saying is I've given Maurice a leadership responsibility amongst the women in our cabinet and across our ministry to pull it all together in the same way that I do across all areas of the government. So I think, to be fair, that characterisation, I, I, I don't think, reflects what I was saying. Yeah, you, said in your opening, you said in your opening remarks about getting the right lens, I think, with, with these changes. Um, your October budget was criticised in some quarters for being blind towards women. Can we expect a sort of a different emphasis in the forthcoming budget uh, to be more mindful of the concerns of, of women? I'd say a couple of things, and I'm sure Maurice would, would like to add, I'm sure. 
having been responsible for the many things that she brought forward into that budget. Uh, first and foremost, what we have seen as a result of that economic recovery plan in that budget is see women get back into jobs. I mean, this was, women were the most exposed and at risk during the COVID period for a whole range of reasons. First of all, was there was the economic security and the loss of jobs, which we saw. And more women have made up those jobs returning to our economy than men. In addition to that, women were also more at risk, whether it was from domestic violence, harassment, or many other things. We put an additional $150 million just in our COVID response to support and protect women against violence during that period. And that has been somewhat successful, working together with states and territories as well. Our budget was very much focused, I think, on delivering outcomes for women. Um, and there were specific initiatives in the women's economic security package that the minister brought forward into that budget. Um, and as we go into this budget, I think we will be working hard to explain right across the country just how much all of the initiatives of our budget deliver positive outcomes for women, um, whether that be their equality, uh, their economic security, uh, their safety, uh, and also their wellbeing, whether in the health or other areas, but Maurice. Uh, thank you. What we've seen uh, in February of this year uh, is women's workforce participation increase to 61.4%. Uh, uh, in February of 2020, it was at 61.2%. The economic response, the budget response of, uh, of last October was about making sure those jobs were protected, those connections were kept with employers, and that people were able to come back into the workforce. The, the gender pay gap, similarly, although this will be a varying figure because of the changes in, uh, in employment rates, but the gender pay gap itself, uh, as at November 2020, now again at 13.4 per cent. That represents the largest narrowing of the gender pay gap since we have been uh, making that statistical analysis. Uh, and we know from uh, the work that the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency is doing that there's more to do uh, in that regard, but it is absolutely the right path, the right trajectory. The Women's Economic Security Statement of 2018 set the groundwork, if you like, for uh, this government's approach to these issues. But in 2020, we brought an absolute COVID-19 response focus to that, uh, about uh, addressing those key issues of workforce participation, of gender pay gap uh, and of women's safety through the initiatives in that women's economic security statement across the diverse cohort that represents Australian women in the workforce in particular. Uh, so I know that with the Minister for Women's Economic Security in the Treasury portfolio, uh, with the opportunity to bring together this task force which has sitting around the table the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance, no matter who those people are in this, in this conversation, those portfolios drive so much of our response. That will enable us to ensure that we continue to do that and that we grow it and that we bring that gender equality lens to those discussions at the highest levels of government in the centre of government. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister you've assigned a number of these women's issues to various women in your ministry. What role then do you see for the other men in your ministry? It seems on the outset that you're making the issue of dealing with women's issues very much the responsibility of women. And if I can as well, Ms Payne, what would you see as a barometer of success for the task force that you'll be leading? What would you hope would be markers that you could achieve in its first five, six months or, or year? Well, first of all, I, I wouldn't share that perspective. It's every single member of the Cabinet's job to work hard for every single Australian, be they men or women, be they Indigenous or non-Indigenous, be they uh, um, be they able bodies or, or living with a disability, um, whether they be a, a senior or they be a youth. Um, it is the job of every minister in my government and every member of the executive, indeed every member of parliament, uh, to ensure that they are working for all Australians. And indeed the task force that has been established, four of the members, uh, myself, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Transport, and uh, of course the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance. Now all, all of us obviously from the central agencies, as happen to be male ministers, uh, but we, we work right across government. And that means a whole of government approach. Um, to ensuring that we're drawing this in. And the task force will work like many of our cabinet subcommittees work, where there are issues dealing with health, 
and aged care, the health and aged care minister will be brought into the room to discuss those issues in particular. When we're talking about jobs, employment, workforce issues, small business, um, women are the proud owners and, and pioneers of small business in this country, always have been. The minister will be brought in to specifically deal with those issues. The Minister for Defence and other ministers um, specifically drawn in to deal with those issues. What I'm seeking to do is ensuring that I have such a strong voice of women in my cabinet that I want to bring that together in this way to really help drive this agenda and make sure that they are the dominant voice uh, when it comes to driving that agenda. So I agree with the, I agree with the Prime Minister in I agree with the Prime Minister in, in relation to the task force. Um, if, if you made the mistake of thinking that it was only about the women around the cabinet table and the ministry table participating, then you would be missing that very large chunk that the Prime Minister has just referred to about the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer of Australia, the Finance Minister being present at every single one of those discussions. That is about the most whole of government response you could ever hope to achieve. It's about putting these issues at the centre of government uh, in terms of, uh, of the the many policy areas uh, that uh, that we would be addressing. And the Prime Minister is also absolutely right when he says, uh, and he has been very clear to his ministers, that whether you are the Minister for, for Mental Health and, and Suicide Prevention or whether you are uh, the Minister for Agriculture, there is a role in each single one of those portfolios, in every single one of those portfolios, to make sure that that focus uh, around uh, the priority, the issues that concern women in that policy area are dealt with and addressed. And I think this task force will uh, make that uh, much more impactful uh, in a way that uh, we have not previously seen in a government in this country, ever, ever. And so that is a pretty strong message, I think. In terms of outcomes, obviously, um, colleagues, uh, you, your colleagues have referred to, uh, to the budget, but we also have on our agenda the development of the next national plan to uh, prevent violence against women and their children. The Women's Safety Minister's Council meets uh, next week uh, on that, and uh, the development of the summit, which is uh, part of that plan and was uh, part of the um, uh, the remit, if you like, for the Women's Safety Minister's Task Force under the National Federation Reform Council. We announced that summit when we announced the, uh, the, the task force itself. Uh, obviously, we'll be providing response to the Respect at Work inquiry. We'll be dealing with these issues of economic security and safety, making sure that those who want to make contributions to the review that Kate Jenkins is undertaking in this place um, are able to do that, and we are able to do that in, uh, in a way that uh, delivers on these priority issues for women and and people here, uh, but also across Australia. Prime Minister, Prime Minister. Uh, uh, the list, so. uh, Senator Payne, as the new Prime Minister for Women, do you concede that you have not done enough as Minister for Women, and do you pledge to be more visible from here on? And Prime Minister, I just want to talk to you about, um, ask you about one of the blokes in your cabinet, Stuart Robert. He resigns from the Turbul Ministry for breaching ministerial code in 2018, accepts 100,000 Rolex watches from a Chinese billionaire, gives a parliamentary speech written by a property developer, uh, repays $38,000 for home internet, and says my bad when he incorrectly blames cyber attack for Centrelink going down last year. How does this bloke get more responsibility in your reshuffle? I don't know whether you knew this, Andrew, but the reason that millions were able to get access and support um, through both, particularly for the job seeker payment over the course of the pandemic, was a direct result of that minister's ability to scale up and put in place one of the most significant responses we've ever seen from a social security agency in this country in our history. He's been appointed to this job because he's done an outstanding job in the one that he's been doing. And you know, when someone does a good job like that, then that sh they show that they can take on responsibility. They can get things done for Australians. So for all of those who could get through to those lines, for those who are calling right now on the floods, you know, over 50 million people, sorry, $50 million was paid out to flood victims last week. That happened because of what Stuart Robert was able to put in place at Services Australia. It was a phenomenal achievement. People can now, when they ring, be paid within, within half an hour. 
That was first established during the bushfires when he did exactly the same thing. So when people have had to rely on him for services, rely on him for payments, rely on him to ensure that they could get up the next morning, know that that money would be in their bank account because that's what he was responsible for, then he has delivered for them. And that's why. That's why he's in my cabinet, because he can be relied upon to deliver the services that Australians indeed rely on. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think, uh, Andrew, the focus that we have had in uh, particularly the, the last year during, uh, during COVID uh, on economic security, on women's safety, on leadership, uh, has been manifested in a number of ways. But the one that I have found particularly value is valuable is the opportunity to engage with uh, Australian women from uh, hundreds and hundreds of different walks of life right across the country in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, the opportunity to initiate a series of national and regional round tables, which are uh, small groups, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, uh, where over more than 30 hours of, uh, of engagement, we have been able to focus on the issues that have been brought to those tables around safety, around economic security, and right around the country. I absolutely acknowledge I didn't physically make it to Western Australia or to, uh, to the Northern Territory uh, during that process, but, uh, but that is, uh, that is a, a task for coming months. And as well as that, uh, in particular, the work that we are able to do with uh, key community-based organisations. So, uh, before International Women's Day, for example, the opportunity to participate uh, in the UN Women Australia uh, keynote uh, addresses uh, Prime Minister here in Canberra uh, with us. Perhaps some of you were at that. I'm not sure. Uh, but more importantly, for me at least, um, the over 1,000 person uh, event in Sydney, live streamed, uh, I think on Channel 7 at the time, where I made very, very clear that my personal view, my own experience in this role over many years, meant that after what we had seen occur in this building and what we had heard described and alleged, the only way to address and to, to respond as a parliament to these uh, issues and to this challenge was to own the problems, was to own the failings, and ultimately to own the solution. And that is what we have been working as a government to do, whether it is through uh, initiating the uh, independent review of this workplace and so many facets of it by the Sex Discrimination Cape Commissioner Kate Jenkins, whether it is the review that Stephanie Foster is doing that will provide the sort of structure and support that uh, this workplace obviously needs for its staff uh, and for those who spend their working lives here. Uh, and then countless others uh, on top of that. So those uh, focuses on leadership, on economic security, on women's safety are what have driven our government uh, and driven me uh, in my role. And I look forward to growing that with uh, the support of Senator Stoker, of Senator Hume, of Senator Rustin in those specific roles. But really importantly, a task force of government that focuses on these issues and includes the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister of Finance. The core of the central agencies that comes to the table and helps to plan the budget, plans the budget, helps to drive the policy development across government is fundamental to that task force. It wouldn't work without them and that's why the Prime Minister has resolved to include them today. I look forward to co-chairing that with the Prime Minister and to making sure that it enables us to address so many of the issues which have been raised in recent weeks. Catherine. Today that you've made this structural change because you feel as though that there was a perspective that was lacking. So, could you be clear about what that perspective was that, that you feel was lacking? And also, why was it lacking? Because you've got good women standing beside you like Maurice Payne. Was it a matter of women not talking or was it a matter of the leadership group not listening? And also, if I may, just on your task list of what you want to achieve, Senator Payne, does that include leading a national discussion about criminal justice reform, given how women fare in, uh, in instances where they report sexual assault? In response to the question, I, w I wouldn't see it in the lens that you have. Um, I would uh, 
I would put it more this way, that I think what we're doing here enhances what we're doing before. I think what we're doing here, as a, when I first became Prime Minister, um, um, we did have, at that stage, the, uh, the highest number of women ever appointed to a cabinet. And, uh, and that has now been restored, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, I've always wanted to ensure there is a strong voice of women in my government, and there has been. I think what we're announcing today goes further than that. I think it sets, it, it sets a new benchmark. It sets a new, a, a new ambition for our government to ensure that we infiltrate all aspects of government. I mean, the big change here is this. Previous governments, previous cabinets have had a minister for women who is expected to cover every single issue that relates to challenges confronting women in the government. I don't think that, from experience, is a very constructive way to get outcomes and results for women. The whole government needs that. And so what I've done here is not just have one, I've got many. In fact, every single member of the cabinet, as others have pointed out, but in particular, I have very capable women serving in some very important portfolios. Home affairs. Home affairs. Big law enforcement portfolio of government. The Attorney General. Another big important portfolio. Indeed already, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Environment. Within Treasury, another of the big institutions of government. Ensuring that my female ministers aren't just in cabinet, but they got their hands on the levers of government in some critical portfolios directly and a part of a government that is completely focused on ensuring that we understand how we need to deliver for women across the country. So that's probably how I'd put it, Catherine. I don't know if I'd describe it as a, as a previous deficiency. I'd see it previously when there were six women in my cabinet. Um, that was also a pretty high mark compared to previous governments. Um, and to go back to seven, um, I'm really pleased about that. And, I'm, and I know that there are more that can come in the future. And, uh, and those women are coming through our ranks now. Um, Jane Hume is very new to the ministry, but she's got off to a tremendous start. She's an excellent Treasury Minister. Um, Amanda Stoker has only just joined um, the Assistant Ministry, uh, together with Nola Marino uh, on the, amongst the Liberals, and uh, with, with Michelle, um, who has served as, as the National Minister for some time. And she is already hard at work, um, working with myself and and Michaelia Cash and our response to respected work. As I told the parliament last week, I've taken personal responsibility for ensuring we bring that together. And we had an excellent discussion in cabinet about this just last week and there'll be more. And I'm looking forward to outlining that response uh, bef before the budget. Maurice. And on criminal justice, uh, we obviously know that reporting uh, and going through the um, difficult process of pursuing criminal justice in these matters uh, is very difficult and the numbers are very low for those who have been uh, impacted who choose to do so. I'm very conscious of that. Uh, and although there have been some reforms, uh, I think it is an area in which we can do more work. I look forward to engaging with Michaelia Cash as the Attorney General on that. Uh, I know, uh, having spoken to organisations like um, Women's Legal Services Queensland or Domestic Violence New South Wales, uh, that they are issues they put firmly on the table. And they are also issues uh, which are on the table for the women's safety ministers. And I think it's part of the development of the ne next action plan and part of that summit process, which, uh, which is um, embedded in that, uh, that, they will have to be canvassed very seriously. And although most of the levers are in criminal law at state and territory le at level, not all of them, but many of them, um, we will be endeavouring to bring those jurisdictions with us in that conversation uh, to make sure that we can address those concerns and remove the barriers that exist to, uh, I think the phrase that we hear is, often I didn't think I would be taken seriously. Well, that's not what our criminal justice system is here to do. Our criminal justice system is here to take victims of crime, whatever it is, seriously. And I think that uh, there is more work to be done in that area. I look forward to being part of it. Prime Time for three more. We'll go one, two, three. Yep. Prime Minister, um, on the back of Andrew's question regarding the performance of you, Maurice Payne, there's that criticism that juggling uh, foreign affairs and the Minister for Women, it's a pretty big ask. Why not just assign one portfolio? And secondly, on Christian Porter, it's a pretty big demotion from you know, the chief lawmaker of the country. Do you expect him to stay on in that capacity beyond the next election? 
I certainly expect him to continue to serve in, in my cabinet uh, both now and, and uh, at, after the next election. We, but we both, all of us, have something we have to do before that occurs, and that is we have to present ourselves for election. So that is ultimately in others' hands. Uh, but absolutely, he's, a, he's, an out, he's been an outstanding minister. He's a person of, of great capability, uh, demonstrated both at the state parliament before coming here from Western Australia and, and what he's been able to achieve uh, since he has been here. Uh, he is focusing on this new portfolio challenge that he has, as well as on his local electorate uh, over in Pearce, which I know he is keen to do. One of the great challenges of being the Attorney General um, and Minister for Industrial Relations and Leader of the Government in the House is that uh, brings you across uh, the Nullarbor a bit more often um, than you otherwise would. And so this will give him that opportunity to focus both on his portfolio, where he'll bring considerable expertise, as well as on um, his local electorate uh, in Pearce. Uh, in, in relation to what I'd, I should probably call the primary minister for women, um, it's just to uh, ensure that no one gets too carried away with the puns for, for, for later. Um, that's what this is about. What I'm trying to bring together is a team of ministers and that Maurice Payne as Minister for Women can bring all that together as a leader of that portfolio team. I mean, the Treasurer brings together a portfolio of ministers right across the Cabinet when we pull together a budget. And I chair the ERC, he is the Deputy Chair. This is a task force approach where Quite uh, uh, what is not regular is for us to be co-chairing. That goes to the, I think, the important lens that I want placed across these issues. And so that is usual for government. And so I recognise that as Minister for Foreign Affairs, that is a very demanding job, a very demanding job. And Maurice Payne does it exceptionally well. But what I want from her in this portfolio is her leadership and her insight and her ability to bring people together to get these outcomes. The work in economic, secu economic security, well, that will be done uh, by Jane Hume. The work in women's safety, as now, it will, be, will be done by Anne. Um, the, a lot of work will be done in the Attorney General's Department and the Minister of Industrial Relations Department, aidedly assisted by Amanda Stoker. So there is a lot of people working on this, and I, sure, I have no doubt that uh, Karen Andrews will bring much in terms of the law enforcement issues. Um, there are attorneys general around the country which I think need to address the very issue that Maurice Payne was just mentioning. And indeed the New South Wales Attorney General I think has, has put forward some very, good, some very good suggestions. What I like about this is people are focused on it and they're moving on to the things you need to do. And so what I've done today is I've put in place a structure in my government that I know can deliver the next set of responses and the, and, and the broader term policy that will get the outcomes that I know women are hankering for, demanding, in fact, and rightfully so. But you've got to get your structures in place in a way that you think can best deliver for that. And that's what we're doing today. It's another step. There are many more to come, and I look forward to making further announcements on that. So I'm going to go to Chris and then Ros, and, and then I'm going to have to tie it up because both of us have a, a meeting we have to get to. I promise that Nine News has suffered a massive cyber attack. What advice do you have on that? Sorry, Nine News has suffered a massive cyber attack. What advice do you have on that? Or what, what message did that send to other Australian businesses? And staying in the online world, some of the worst abuse we see nowadays is against women online. Uh, can the federal government do anything by passing laws about that that might curb that? So Nine News first. If you don't. Well, look, on, on Nine, uh, they need to work with ASD and our cyber security team, as all uh, corporates that are impacted by these cyber attacks. You will recall some time ago, I, I stood in the Blue Room and I, I announced what had been a very serious set of attacks uh, against both Australian companies and, and other agencies. And our cyber security team uh, through ASD uh, do a tremendous job in working with state governments and territory governments, but as well as major corporates, including, as I know, they'll be working with Nine right now uh, to ensure that they can put in place the, uh, the protections that they need to, to, to have um, their systems restored and, and to have them restored safely. We regrettably live in a world where this happens. Um, we can't be naive about it, and uh, we have built a, a tremendous capability here at a federal level uh, to provide support to companies all around the country, be they very large ones like uh, Nine or, or small and medium-sized businesses. And it's important that all of our, all of our economy uh, are very mindful uh, of the need for cyber security defences. I mean, that is also an area where Jane Hume is working uh, to ensure that uh, our, when we, as we digitise our economy, um, that cyber security is a key platform upon which that is all built. Uh, in relation to the second matter, 
regarding social media. I, I said this on the weekend. We're living in a society in which respect is degrading. And if we want to see more respect in our community, we've all got to practice it more. When I stood here and announced the Royal Commission on Aged Care, I talked about the need to establish a culture of respect for older Australians. Same is true for women. The same is true for people with disabilities. The same is true for people, um, Indigenous Australians. But it's got to draw out of a well of respect in our society, which I fear is sadly depleting. People saying that they, don't disres they disrespect each other or I don't respect that person or whatever it happens to be. We've got to build the respect again. And one of the key um, degraders of respect in our country is social media. Sure, it has some positive purposes. I don't discount that. Of course it does. But it, is a, it can be a very dangerous tool in, in disrespectful hands. And we've seen that with the trolling and abuse and harassment, particularly of women. I, I pay tribute to Erin Mullen again for the great campaign she's led and that we've backed in with changes we've already made in this area. But our government has probably, our government, no, our government has stood up to the big tech companies on this like no other government in the, in the world. And we have taken on the fights with them that no others would. And others have followed us, whether it's on uh, terrorist or inciting content, or indeed now ensuring that news media organisations actually can get a fair deal to ensure that you can all do the job that you do and find job that you do in, in a democracy like Australia. We've been protecting our democracy by standing up those big tech companies. But I can tell you, a big part of my response to this will be ongoing work in the area of e-safety and on social media. And, you know, people write things down without any consideration of the hurt and torment that it means to other people. This is happening with, with, with young people you know, in, they're not even in their teens, and some of them are writing this. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and they become desensitised to it, and they stop writing it then, and they just say it. And this becomes how Australians potentially talk to each other in the future. Australia, we've got to fix this, and we've got to take some responsibility about how we are behaving toward each other online and directly. Love one another. It was a good piece of advice given many years ago around about at Easter time. And yes, please. Um, so firstly, on the cyber issue, wearing one of my hats at the moment uh, as uh, acting defence minister, obviously ASD and the Australian Cyber Security Centre are very focused on working with corporate Australia to make sure that corporate Australia is protecting itself. Those eight steps that uh, the ACSC sets down, this is a salutary reminder that nobody is immune uh, and that uh, they are very important uh, and get very important steps for corporates to take to protect themselves. Uh, they are, they are a, uh, a threshold basic engagement, I think, and so uh, raising that question today is, uh, is a very important one. On social media, can I just say a couple of things? Prime Minister's referred to the role of the e-safety commissioner that we have here in Australia, and I think Julie Inman Grant, who holds that position, is an exceptional operator. Uh, she is uh, constructive and accessible and clear about uh, steps that people can take to protect themselves online. I think she does a very good job at that. We've worked closely with our colleagues internationally on disinformation, for example, which is all perpetrated overwhelmingly through social media, particularly in relation to, uh, to the pandemic. We're dealing with vaccine scepticism, uh, particularly in the Pacific at the moment, PNG as well, uh, and again, all perpetrated through social media. But I have said to the Prime Minister more than once that I think the words of Sasha Baron Cohen last year in his uh, very, very powerful speech on this issue uh, are timely reminders for all of us. I think the problem with social media is it is much less social good these days and much more social harm. And where we've tried, sorry, where we've tried, uh, where we have seen in the past uh, things in, uh, in our societies which are dangerous, which are harmful to society, we have overwhelmingly taken steps to put provisions in place to protect people from that harm, whether it is drugs, whether it is drink driving, uh, whether it is uh, dangerous driving, whether it is uh, swimming without knowing how to swim, that basic. But we haven't yet been able to grapple with this in relation to social media, uh, and I think it is uh, very much a task for this decade. Senator Payne, so the Prime Minister for Women 
What do you think about Andrew Lamming sticking around until the next election, especially given his inappropriate behaviour? Do you think that's good enough? Uh, I think the Prime Minister's phrase is primary uh, rather than prime. But Mr Lamming has taken a very serious step to leave this job, uh, leave this role at the next election. Uh, I wouldn't think for a moment that that is a step anyone in these roles takes lightly. Uh, he has been uh, here for some years now. His behaviour is clearly inappropriate. He has taken steps to address that, the steps that the Prime Minister outlined. That is the minimum that he should do, and he is doing that. And then he has indicated he will not be returning to this place. That's a clear indication that he knows his ongoing role here is, uh, is not appropriate. Uh, and uh, I just say to, uh, to my colleagues uh, across parliaments across the world that we have a responsibility in the way we engage with the public, the way we engage with constituents, the way, frankly, we engage with each other. And if nothing else, the last few months has taught us the importance of that and the importance of doing that respectfully. Uh, last one. Um, I think uh, people would agree with the, the Minister for Women that what he's done is the minimum and there's much more that could be done. He's one of those people you just spoke about who writes horrible things online, um, abusing his own constituents, taking photographs of, people, of women's underwear in public. Can you see that people see a double standard here, that in other workplaces in Australia, someone who was uh, found to have done these things would have been sacked on the spot, not had the luxury of, of uh, picking their own, choosing their own time in a year, uh, picking up another $210,000 from the taxpayer along the way? Uh, it, and why shouldn't people just see this as a cynical move on your part? Because if you stand up today, use that podium, that microphone and say, as Prime Minister, I don't want this bloke in the Liberal Party. I don't want him in the parliament. He'd be out. I know that it's a question for the party, but if you were to say that today, there, now, he'd be gone. But he's not going to be. In any other workplace in Australia, he would be. So isn't the reality that you can't afford to lose Andrew Lamming, because he's a number, and if you lose his number, you lose control of the House of Reps? He's not running in Mark. He's not putting himself forward for re-election within the Liberal Party. He is committed to undertake the behavioural change he needs to undertake. And, uh, and that's what he needs to do. And he needs to come back with a completely different attitude and a completely different behaviour. He was elected to this place by the people in his electorate. That's who he was elected by. And he was elected to serve here for three years, Mark. He was elected to serve here for three years um, in this parliamentary term. And that's what he intends to do and continue to serve the people in his electorate. And uh, I'm following the very same approach that other governments have followed in the past. Thanks very much.